Our text today is taken from the 18th chapter of Revelation, reading verses 1 through 6. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich, through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which he hath filled, fill to her double. Now the false religious system has been raised up by the dragon to give sophistication, honor, and sanctity to the world of humanism. Humanism, the first beast, is the spokesman in this world for the dragon. The harlot speaks with the voice of the beast. She is the mother of harlots. In her is found the blood of the saints and the martyrs of all ages. There are only two basic things in this world, good and evil. All that is not good is evil. There is no middle or neutral ground It was Jesus who said that all who are not for him are against him. All that is not of God and his word and his truth, and that does not come from the new man in Christ, is evil. It makes no difference how religious it may be or how intellectually honorable in the minds of men. It is evil because it is at cross purposes with God and his word. We're reminded again of this when the mighty angel says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. We've talked before about the twofold proclamation of the fallen condition of Babylon. It's not redundancy, nor is it for emphasis. Two facts are being underscored here. One is that the whole false religious world and the people who are deceived by it have fallen by choice. It's a cause and effect judgment. They join themselves to the whore, and her fall has brought them down with her. When you make the decision to do wrong, that is a choice you have. But the destruction that follows in your life or your church or whatever is an inevitable result. You cannot do wrong and then choose to have no negative consequences. That's where the autonomous world of liberation, First Amendment rights, individual sovereignty, and so on, has spun wildly out of any sane and useful orbit. God never at any time gave man free choice when it comes to the matter of consequences for his deeds. Nor did man climb the evolutionary ladder, developing this arbitrary control over his own destiny through the survival of the fittest. These mad rantings of insane philosophers are very effective in deceiving fallen man and making him a victim, but they have no influence or impact on reality. You cannot defy God and his laws without destroying yourself. The wages of sin are death. And then Babylon has fallen for another reason. She is the subject of the objective judgment and wrath of God. You are not going to defy God without falling victim to his wrath. God will not let her get away with it 
on the cause and effect level. God is not going to be mocked. The whore shall reap what she has sown. That is the way it works. If you defy the laws of God, you're going to die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God told man this before he ever did it. In the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now the dragon, or the serpent, as he was in the garden scene, scoffed at the warning. Huh, big threat on God's part, trying to scare you. What a shallow and a shoddy tactic, trying to rule over people's lives through fear. You're not going to die. Do you believe that? For heaven's sakes, Eve, go do what you want to do. Don't worry about that. God's just trying to intimidate you. Now, of course, Satan did not believe what he was telling Eve. He knew what would happen to her because it had happened to him before. He was lying to her so he could get her out of God's control and into his. And there the great contest between the lie of sin and the truth of God, which has already taken place before time and history as we know it, was joined for the human race. God warned Eve that she would die, and she did die. And so has every one of her children since then. All the death, the misery, and every inferior thing that has ever happened in this world has happened because Eve did not believe God when he said, In the day you break my law, you will die. It happened because God cannot and will not allow it. But the house of evil falls because it cannot stand up. Wrongdoing rots away the foundation and destroys. Babylon has fallen because she destroyed herself. And Babylon has fallen because God destroyed her. Because she has fallen, Babylon has become the hangout for every evil and contemptible and foul thing. I remember that this is a discussion about religion in this particular instance. This great religious system that was built up by the dragon to support humanism and give sanctity to it. But it is a deceitful and a corrupt thing and it has fallen because of rot, corruption and decay. It has become the flop house for evil things, evil schemes and evil people. When God announced the coming change in the covenant, he said in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah in verse 31, this old covenant is not going to work. God himself found fault with it. And he said, behold, the days come when I'm going to make a new covenant and it's not going to be like the old covenant. By bringing in the new covenant, God banished from his kingdom forever any hope of reformation of the old creation through religion. When Jesus had been delivered up to be killed, Pilate said to him, Listen, man, you better start answering me because I have the power of life and death over you. But Jesus told Pilate that he was foolish to believe that he could exercise power over the Son of God. You have no power at all but what the Heavenly Father gives you, he told the Roman governor. If I wanted to do so, at this very moment, I could call for 12 legions of angels to come down here and tear this place to shreds and deliver me. But Jesus would not do that, nor will he answer Pilate, because what Pilate was asking him to defend was not worth defending my kingdom is not of this world, Jesus told him. If it was, well, then we'd fight. If Pilate could have taken away from him anything that amounted to anything, Jesus and his servants would fight. If they did, they would win, just as God and his servants had won in Egypt and at Jericho and a hundred other places. But Jesus and his servants were not going to fight because his kingdom, which once was of this world in the dispensational sense, is no longer from here. This means that the original creation and the children of Adam no longer form the basis of his kingdom in this world, 
We do not have a controversy, Jesus told Pilate. You're threatening to take something away from me that does not mean anything. From that time on, the goals and the purposes and the works of the kingdom of God had nothing whatever to do with the preservation of the old world or any of its systems, one of which is religious humanism. The false religious world, on the other hand, has always been preoccupied with this world and what's going to happen to it. It consists entirely in the original creation and the natural children of Adam. What's going to happen to that which we've worked so hard for, which our forefathers died to establish for us, they cry. And what's going to happen to that which I've laid up in the bank? What is going to become of my plans for the good life? Woe is me. What is going to happen? Well, this is the lament going up from the whole false religious world, and it is a false cause from false religion. Jesus called it a Nicolaitan system. It's preoccupied with wealth, well-being, respect, and other strictly mortal concerns having to do with the here and the now and which pass with the time. The harlot has her pitch men out sucking people in with the assurance that God wants them to be wealthy and well. Christ died for that purpose. Oh, this sounds good to the foolish who do not have a vision of truth and eternity. They flock to this false doctrine like bees to honey. But it is a doctrine which Jesus said he hates with a passion. Now the vials of wrath and vengeance have been poured out on the seat of the beast and in a judgment of the whore, Babylon the Great, the mystery, the mother of harlots. As a result, she is fallen, and with her every false thing. Now, this is the lament that we hear coming from the false religious humanism. Oh no, we've lost everything. All of our merchandise, all of our sense of identity, all of our culture, all of our fun, our entertainment, our merriment, it's all gone. There is no more the sound of music, no more the sound of the bridegroom and the bride, no more costly oils and spices bought and sold, no more gold and silver, no more flowers and horses, and no more empire ruling over the souls of men. We have no more slaves, and we can make no new captives. All that has always motivated the false religionist has gone down with her when the great whore went down. And this is indeed true in a moral and practical sense. The false things of the humanistic world of religion do not satisfy. And we may say that they do, but they don't, and we know it. We have labored to get rich, and now our family has broken up, and there's no one to share it with but a bunch of panhandlers who are only interested in what they can get. This is a present and an ongoing truth. Even so, what we are seeing here is how it is all going to end. John was taken and shown the judgment of the great whore and what will happen in that day. At present, all of the grafters and soldiers of fortune are still in Babylon. But when she falls, they cry out with a great lament that they have lost everything they have worked for and trusted in. Now, one of the really significant things to remember is that the focus here is on the false world of religious humanism. I say the focus is on the false world of religious humanism. We are not talking about the secular world of education, philosophy, and materialism. Not just now. We're looking at Babylon, the mother of harlots, and all things that bring men into that city. They have sold their souls to get in on it. Now it's all going up in smoke. 
They forfeited the riches of heaven to fill their hands and their pockets with this glittering, aromatic treasure, only to find that it is cheap paste and it is melting into a pool of pot metal reeking with the sulfurous smoke that burns the nose, the eyes, and the soul. The warning is for the Christian to separate himself from this system. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her so you do not become partakers of evil. And come out of her so that you do not get judged along with her by the same plagues. This is an urgent and a sober warning for several reasons. The first is to see clearly that God's people can be found down in Babylon. If not, how could they come out of her? And why would God tell them to? Remember what is taking place in some Christian churches in the third and fourth chapters. They had Jezebel, the same whore, in their church seducing people, and God expressed strong displeasure with them. Last time we were given a close and definitive look at this whore. Now we know who she is and what she looks like and how she operates. We know that she is the false religious system, that great city in which the false prophet has his pulpit. Because of the subtlety of the thing, one may not have known before, but he knows now. So it's high time to get out and get out in a hurry. God's patience is wearing thin. Whether the end of the world comes in our time or not, and it may, the individual Christian may not have much more time. The Christian? Yes. The Christian, whom do you think God is addressing when he said, come out of her, my people? What happens to God's people who get involved with false religious systems? Well, they're just going down to sea and look, stand around, find out all, what all the noise and excitement is about. They're not going to buy anything. They're just going to look. But it's not long before they find themselves committing the same sacrilege. It's not long before they lose their conscience about such things as obeying parents, obeying husbands, obeying employers, obeying elders, being pure and holy in mind and body and appetite, and not being materialistic nor living for pleasure. They get caught up in the spirit of it all. Because iniquity abounds, their love waxes cold. Everybody else is doing it, they argue. So how bad can it be? I don't see anything happening to them. Our old-fashioned leaders were making too much of this, and they had us intimidated. But the next thing you know, they drift over into the worldly way of acting. A little flirting, a little meeting in out-of-the-way places just to have a quiet lunch and talk, of course, because he or she understands me and my problems. I have many of the same themselves. I need someone who understands me to talk to. That's nothing more than that. Well, maybe to have an innocent little drink or two to relax the tension and get comfortable. Hmm. Following close behind are the plagues, broken homes, unhappiness, Frustration, depression, gloom, disappointment, a hard heart, an angry spirit, and then a thoroughly backslidden condition. Oh, but this does not mean a lack of interest in religion. After all, it is religious humanism that has brought this on. And it was at the religious bar that we got our big break and were introduced personally to the whore, the star of the show. Oh, I know what you're thinking, but you would not feel that way if you could have met her. She's not at all like what people say. She's so nice and so warm and so interested in your life. She loves, and not just her own things. It makes me sick sometimes the way people gossip about things they don't know anything about. Well, you know what she said? She said, 
We're not supposed to be judgmental. We're supposed to love one another. Yes, religion remains, but godliness goes away and is replaced by all of the just-described maladies. While you're in bed with some Adonijah the harlot has introduced you to, your husband is in bed with the harlot. So now you tell me, who's getting the best of this, or more properly, the worst of it? You see, those are plagues. Are those not plagues? Is that not what God has brought upon the great harlot? You defied God so you could have the good life, and now the good life, the good things are taken from you. Not only because of the judgment of God, but because of the lie. You cannot find life, truth, and contentment in that way. You cannot find them in that place. That is the deceit. There is the treachery. But you do not avoid this awful fate by hearing about it now and again and thinking about it for a little while. You have to watch and stay sharp. There are impressive religious salesmen around to peddle the line of the false religious system. They are schooled and skilled in their profession. They could sell a sow's ear for a silk purse. They know how to get your name on the dotted line. If you think otherwise, just sit around and listen to their pitch for a while and see what you wind up with parked in your garage. There are a number of examples of this in the Bible. One such is in the 22nd chapter of Numbers about the man Balaam. This is a most significant and frightening story. Well, we won't repeat it all, of course, but it's a very interesting thing. Balaam was a prophet of the Lord. Balak, the king of Moab, wanted to fight with the Israelites, but he wanted the blessing of this prophet, so he sent for Balaam to come and bless him. His servants offered Balaam many things to come with them, and Balaam said, I can't go until I see what the Lord has to say about this. When Balaam talked to the Lord, the Lord said simply, No, Balaam, I don't want you to go with him. Well, this was very simple, very clear, very unemotional, very unambiguous. Balaam, do not go. Now, Balaam was not an Israelite, and he knew nothing about the Israelites. He lived out in the back, remote hill country of Moab. He spent most of his time in prayer and study, and he was unaware of the controversy between the children of Lot and the children of Abraham. But that was all right. He didn't need to know. What he did know was that the Lord did not want him to go with these men. So Balaam went out and told them, I cannot go with you because the Lord says no. After telling him what had happened, Balak sent them back to Balaam on his behalf to say this, listen, Balaam. Now just listen for a minute, will you? It will not hurt you just to listen. And as an aside, that's one of the biggest and most consequential lies the devil ever told. By just getting Eve to listen for a minute, Satan brought down the whole human race. And by just getting them to listen, the university, one of the devil's most effective tools ever, has destroyed the minds of untold millions of Christian young people. But in any case, they said, Balaam, just listen, will you? You want to amount to something as a prophet of the Lord, do you not? You're stuck out here in the middle of nowhere with no one to listen to you and no money to get down off of this mountain and go anywhere. But you want to be an evangelist. You want to save souls. You want to see people in this world worship the Lord. Well, what about this proposition? Come down here with my emissaries and you come and bless me and I'll give you all the money you want to build all the altars you want and all the tabernacles you can get up. And if you want cattle and sheep to sacrifice, you can have all of them you want. And if enough people aren't worshiping your God, I'll pass a law that demands that everybody worship the God of Balaam. Now here you are, Balaam, sitting up here on your lonely mountain, wishing for things that are never going to happen. And I'm offering you the opportunity to see it all come true. I can do it for you, man. You can make your mark as a man of God. You can be one of the most admired and best known and, by the way, one of the wealthiest men in Moab. 
which I know is not your motivation, but still, nothing wrong with wealth if there is nothing wrong with it, right? Balaam thought, wow, maybe this is my opportunity. All the things I've set up here and dreamed about are now within my reach. What a great chance. Well, I don't want to go against the Lord, that's for sure. Nothing would be worth that. But I will go back and just kind of talk to the Lord about it and feel him out and see what comes of it. And that was the sin of Balaam. Instead of being known as a great man of God, Balaam has been known by virtually every child of God for 4,000 years as a traitor to the cause and the exemplification of what not to be. Balaam sought his expression in that humanistic world of religion on which God had put his brand of faults and forbidden. He stood and looked too long at the harlot, and he wound up in her bed. <laughs>